Hello, and uh, welcome to How to Get Your Paper Published, presented by Carver Publishers. We're delighted uh, that you're able to join us for today's webinar. Um, my name is Neil Adams. I work in Carver's North American office, uh, and I just have a couple of announcements to make um, before we get started. Uh, the first is uh, that this webinar, uh, we really would want to make it as interactive as possible. So uh, we encourage you very much to, uh, when you listen to the presentation, to ask your questions, submit them on the um, questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen, um, and we will do our very best to get to all of your questions um, in, um, in time for the program. If we don't, if is this not enough time, we will um, uh, try to answer the questions and send them after the program to you. So we appreciate um, sending you questions. Uh, that would be great. Um, I also wanted to uh, let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded um, and we are will actually send it a link, uh, an email after the program containing the link to the webinar to all the attendees um, in case you're interested in listen to it again. Um, and finally, um, if you enjoy this webinar, we encourage you to visit um, the Carger campus, um, which is uh, at uh, www.carger.com. And it is uh, where we have many other programs um, and educational webinars uh, that are available uh, for you to look at to, uh, to help. Here it is, there's the Carger campus. Um, you can see the address, um, and we encourage you to visit this um, and look at the resources um, that are available to you. Um, in addition, uh, also, uh, this webinar, How to Get Your Papers Published, is uh, very much related to a book um, that Carger publishes. Um, it's a, a book that you see on the next screen, How to Get Your Biomedical Paper Published, um, and that is also available um, on uh, www.carger.com. So thank you very much uh, for your attention to those couple of um, announcements. And now I'm very happy to turn the uh, program over to uh, my colleague, uh, Paul Lavender, who will uh, take you through the program. Paul, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Neil. Um, welcome everybody and thank you for joining. Uh, just a couple of words about me so you know who I am. My name, as Neil said, is Paul Lavender. I have about eight years of experience as medical writer and editor. And then after that, as a managing editor, publication manager, and then head of education at Cargo Scientific Publishers. So the aim of this webinar really is based around this cartoon, which actually pretty much exemplifies how I felt as a medical writer when I first started out. So you see that poor scientist over there on the left-hand side, and there seems to be this road towards getting your paper accepted. And there's all these people blocking or on the side of the road with clubs and chainsaws and axes. And you don't really know why they would stop this guy or who they are. And that's really, Pretty much how I felt when I the first time I clicked submit when I submitted a paper. I didn't really understand the publishing process and I didn't know who would try and stop this paper being accepted or why they would stop it. So my aim of this webinar is to, uh, for those of you who don't know this publication process very well in uh, scientific publishing, is to help guide you through so you know what you're facing. And I think really the important thing is that it's not hard for that scientist to walk the road, the road's not so far. For him not to get published, somebody actively has to try to stop him. So I really want to explain the reasons to you why people would stop a paper from being published and put names to those faces. And as Neil said, I, I really encourage you to use the question function down there because if really we only get value from this webinar if you take something away and i'm very much aware i'm competing for your attention that's just one click away from being just from going to netflix or checking a chat message or social media 
And I really want that everyone who's taken the time to join takes away at least one thing of value. So if you think, oh, is he going to answer this question or is he going to answer, uh, address this point, just put it in the questions, as Neil said, and even if we can't get to it here, we will get back to you with an answer as best we can. So let's start off by putting some names to these faces that you're seeing here. The guy with a sword. That's normally the first person encountered by um, an author. That's the editorial office manager. If the author gets past the editorial office manager, he'll encounter the editor or the editor in chief. Further down the road, you meet the peer reviewers. And then finally, at the very end, you come back to the editor in chief for the second time. So what we're gonna do is go through each of these people in detail. And we're going to look at the reasons why they would drop a sword or drop an ax or bring down the club and ways to avoid that happening to you and your own paper. So let's start over here with the editorial office manager. So in the next few slides, I've put the reason why the editorial office manager may stop a paper for, from progressing on the left and the potential solutions on the right. And yes, you will get copies of the slides at the end of the session. So one of the first reasons that an editorial office manager may reject a paper is that it's clearly out of the journal's scope. So an editorial office manager is not rarely scientifically trained in the discipline of the journal. Often they handle multiple journals and it's more of an administrative administrative role than a scientific role. So it'd have to be something quite struck clearly out of scope for the journal, like a preclinical paper to a clinical journal. The solution, of course, is to find a right journal that's within the scope of the article. So you can check the aims and scopes on every journal's website. You can have a look at your own reference list in the article and see which journals frequently appear. They may be good candidates. You can use online resources such as journalguide.com. And you can also outsource um, finding a target journal. So we partner with Inago. And if you use that link there, they give a 10% discount to Carga clients. So do keep that link in mind. They, and they do a nice service where they take the paper and they search for target journals based on perceived impact, time to publication, and a variety of other factors. Why else might the editorial manager reject a paper? So first, clearly out of scope. And second main reason is that the author guidelines are not followed. Now, the author guidelines can be about the article structure, the article type itself. For example, some journals don't accept their case reports or commentaries, that the word count is wrong, that the formatting of the figures is wrong, the re resolution or style. So this is a very, as I said, uh, administrative check, checking the article against the guidelines and checking to all of all the criteria stipulated in the guidelines been met. So the ways to avoid this problem. Well, the first is to use standard reporting guidelines for each article type. So I've put the Quota Network there, which has, I think, about 450 guidelines, but the main ones really are consort for randomized control trials, uh, stroke for observational uh, trials, um, STAR-D, care for case reports, and those are on the main page. And they have checklists and structures, which when writing an article are incredibly helpful and are generally the standard accepted by most journals. Uh, the second thing, based on my experience, is to take a look at the guidelines and allow three times longer than your best guess. Some guidelines can be incredibly complicated, although the general trend is to simplify these and they're getting less complicated. But back in uh, 2011, when I wrote one paper, it actually told you paragraph by paragraph what they wanted in the paper and how many paragraphs you could have. And again, there's a solution to outsource this. This means that you can uh, pay an external company to format the paper 
in the requirements of that particular journal. So the editorial office managers looked at, is the article pretty much in the scope of the journal at the top level? Have they followed the guidelines that we've stipulated on, on the journal's website? And the next thing that most editorial offices will look at is um, a top line review of the ethics. So if it's a clinical trial, um, obviously you'd be looking for a clinical trial number, some proof that it's been registered, and just an acknowledgement that patient consent was obtained and ethics committee approval were obtained. These should be visible in the paper, uh, normally in the method section, and if requested also in the cover letter. This also includes animal studies, for example, with the ARRIVE guidelines. Another reason for rejection could be a lack of up-to-date references, and this would it's not common, but it could indicate to the editorial office manager that this article has been submitted a long time ago to a journal and then resubmitted and resubmitted and never updated in the meantime. So if they have a lot of papers coming, coming to the journal, that could be a reason uh, to reject at an early stage. And of course, the solution would be to conduct a new literature search and update the references. And the uh, very poor language quality is also a reason at this stage why it might be uh, rejected or sent back to the author. Because again, if the language quality is very poor, um, it's very hard to take it on to the next stage of checks and evaluation. And an editorial office manager would be quite well placed to just have a top level review and if there's uh, obvious spelling mistakes in the title and the abstract doesn't really make sense grammatically, then that would be a reason why they may send it back. And of course, the solutions with language quality either fix it, ask a friend or colleague to help, or again, to outsource it. And last but not least, a reason for rejection or return to the authors at this stage is plagiarism. And so this is one thing that editorial office managers check for. And there are a lot of tools, AI powered tools to help the editorial office manager in this. So a lot of publishers use standard tools that read a paper and then compare the text in that paper to the literature and then give a similarity score. Now, these scores aren't always perfect. We, it is necessary to do a manual check, but it does give an idea if whole chunks of text have been copied and pasted from other published work. And if there's um, a strong element of plagiarism, then that will, of course, be rejected and returned to the authors. Now, I, in the slide you'll see, I've even said uh, to be aware of this with your own work. So this means that if you've previously published a paper and you've transferred the copyright to that publisher, which you probably have done if it hasn't been an open access paper, then copying and pasting chunks, even from the method section, even if you're using the same or a similar methodology is still liable to be flagged as plagiarism. So in those cases, you can um, alter the text slightly, or you can contact the original publisher and ask for permission to reuse certain sections as an author normally publishes grant miss. But again, just to be aware of it, that even though it's something you've written previously, it may still qualify as plagiarism if it's been published elsewhere. So those are the reasons why an editorial office manager, that very first line, that very first person would reject or send the paper back to the author. So right now I'm just opening the question tab to see if anybody has any questions about that before we go on to the editor. Uh, Paul, there is a question. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, do you recommend any abstract sites, um, i.e. plop in an abstract to find an appropriate journal? And if so, which sites would you recommend? Yeah, so it's a, actually a really good question. Um, 
There are publisher specific sites. So for example, at Carga, we have um, um, a site that allows or, or page that allows authors to um, copy and paste the abstract. They're recommended um, to the most appropriate Carga journal. I think Elsevier have the same to the best of my knowledge that you can copy and paste your abstract and it recommends, or it could be Springer, but they recommend the best Elsevier or the best Springer journal. Off the top of my head, I'm not sure which neutral ones there are, so publish and non-specific. Um, however, I think it now could, could be a good place to start. I think they're introducing a new service like this. Yeah, I, I think they have the author one service and you can upload a manuscript uh, free of charge. And I think they do journal recommendations from that, but I'm not entirely sure, I have to be honest. So if we have your email address, I'll get back to you. There are people who are a bit more up to date with that technology. Certainly a Google search will take you to one, and it's something that's developing all the time. I, I was up to date about a year ago, and it's moving so quickly. Uh, I would want to just double check that. But yes, there are, there are certainly those sites. You just have, if you don't want to be tied into a particular publisher, and normally that happens when somebody has a, a voucher to use with a publisher, like an article processing fee to use with that publisher. If you don't want to be tied in, then you need a, a neutral site that's not on a publisher's website. And I'm, I think Inago have one now. Um, it's possible Editage do as well, but I would want to double check to give you a more precise answer. Great, thanks Paul. Thank you. Um, another question um, that came in, interesting one, how much percentage of plagiarism is acceptable by a journal? It, it varies according to the journal. Um, Truthfully, in my, my experience, I have some limited experience using the plagiarism tools, and there was never a percentage to say acceptable or unacceptable that we used. There was a percentage to say investigate further or don't investigate further. So I would say if it had a score of around, I think it was like 15 to 20 percent from memory. Uh, we would look further and in, further into the paper and look at the sources that were indicated by the tool and do a manual check. I would, uh, as a rule of thumb, copying, pasting a sentence, even two sentences is probably okay, particularly in the methods section where you would expect a lot of overlap with published work. Publishers are a lot more forgiving there. Um, and perhaps less forgiving with the discussion and the introduction sections, there you should really try not to copy and paste. Just great. paraphrase the sentences. It just, and that's great, Paul, thanks. We just have a, a couple more questions, then we should um, probably move to the mm -hmm. next session. But before we do, um, a question came in, do you recommend any language proofing services? And does outsourcing increase the chances of publication? So we, we recommend Anago because we, we work with them well. They're, they're a close partner. And in that link, you get a 10% discount. And they're also, and it's, a, it's a good value service. And I think most, they offer a rejection guarantee. I think depending on the size of the paper, normally between 200 and $400. And if it's rejected on the grounds of language, they'll refund your money. So that was one thing that we, we liked and we, we recommend Anago. Um, and would it increase your chances of getting published? It removes one obstacle, but there are other obstacles to overcome, which you'll see as we progress through. Certainly, what is useful is because they give you a certificate to submit with the paper. And sometimes you can have peer reviewers or editors who are checking in an, as non native speakers. And it can just be nice to see that certificate and say, okay, it's, it's been checked, that we don't need to worry about the language. We can focus on other things while assessing the paper. So it certainly doesn't reduce your chances of being published. It's, it's, it, there's several reasons, several criteria to get published and it just ticks one very easily and makes it easier for the publisher, yes. 
Great. And one one final question before we move on. Um, are there any AIs that can detect plagiarism, which are also um, free to use, um, like websites and such? I I think okay. Again, this is one one where I'm probably about a year out of date in a rapidly changing landscape. I believe, and I'm but I'm not 100% sure that if you upload to author one, the Inago tool, it does flag similarities, but I am not sure about that. Um, certainly for publishers, there are tools, but they're, they're paid tools. Uh, I, but I do think there are more services coming online, such as author one, where they help authors by flagging potential plagiarism problems before they submit. And I think even some submission systems are starting to incorporate that. It's a very rapidly evolving landscape. Great. Thanks, Paul. Cool. So let's uh, assume then you've now got past your editorial office manager. Um, this is really the workflow of a, a very tr of a traditional scientific journal. The majority of journals still work in this way. And if we have time at the end, we'll discuss the exceptions to the rule, like uh, some mega journals and some open access journals. So, but this is the traditional workflow. You've gone past your editorial office manager over here. And now the next person you need to get past is the editor. Now, what's the editor looking for? They're looking for different things than the editorial office manager. So the first thing looks the same. I said out of scope. But the editor's eyes and the editorial office manager's eyes are very different for what constitutes in scope and out of scope. So, for example, if you take a, an audiology journal and you may think, OK, well, my paper's in audiology, I'll submit. But when you really check what the journal's publishing, it may be 80% about cochlear implantation, a very specific field. Or with oncology, they may really publish a lot more on a particular type of oncology treatment or diagnosis. So it's really worth checking what the informal scope is and not just going by the title or the guidelines. What's a journal really publishing on and what are the editorial board members and the editors specialized in? The other thing the editor will look at is, of course, the impact or perceived impact of the article and one reason they may reject and if any of you in the audience have ever submitted to nature and i have not on my own behalf um, you might have had the experience of having a rejection email come back within about 20 minutes and that's probably the editorial office manager but may also be the scientific editor taking a quick look and saying i'm sorry that's not advanced enough for a journal of nature or new england journals level so scientific impact is often measured by citations uh, the impact it has in terms of the citations of future research how much future research did it influence so one way of trying to gauge what impact your paper has is to look at similar papers, see how often they were cited, where they were published, asking an experienced colleague. Because, of course, when you've worked on a study yourself for at least months, but likely years, it's easy to lose perspective of it. So it's good to ask around and get an honest opinion about what level of journal you should be aiming at in terms of its scientific impact. And again, I've put Anago there because they have the journal finder service that does, of course, take this into account. When, uh, as a rule of thumb, if you think of a journal has an, has an impact factor of one, that means each article published in that journal would be cited once. Uh, if you, that goes up to journals, the higher end, I mean, nature, I think, is about 40. And the highest is a journal on cancer statistics, which I think has an impact factor of about 300, which is in incredible. But of course, cancer statistics are cited a lot. So 
the first question the editors ask is, is this really something I'm interested in and my editorial board are interested in? Is it got a scientific impact? Is it worthy of publication in this journal? And the other reason an editor may reject, um, which is less frequent these days, is that quite simply there were too many high quality papers being submitted. So this is particularly true when you have a, a journal that publishes a limited number of pages per year, a traditional journal, and uh, has a very high rejection rate where your paper may be good, but it just so happens that the next paper that's been submitted is even better. So you should ask when you look at a journal, is it publishing you know, well ahead of schedule? I mean, does it seem like they have a lot of material already in their pipeline that may decrease the chances of being published there? Does it publish infrequently? Some journals only publish quarterly, so there's not a lot of space for your paper to fit in. And what's the rejection rate? Do they publish it? Often journals do on their website. If you're looking like above 80, 90%, that's a strong rejection rate. So you can say, you know, if it's publishing extremely high quality work, well ahead of schedule, publishes infrequently with a high rejection rate, it would be good to have a backup journal, at least. You can assume it's gonna be a, quite challenging to get published there. And one point I'd like to mention, the last point with the editor is, editors, you know, they're obviously, leaders in their field they're very well respected and they're very busy so very often this decision may be based on the abstract the title the cover letter and the authors or the institution where if that's not blinded from the editor and so they will often make that decision quite quickly they'll be going through 10 20 sometimes more papers in one sitting and will make a, a relatively quick decision. And the reason I mention this is that very often with authors, we find these are the things that are left to the last. A lot of love goes into the, to the paper itself and the abstract and the title and the cover letter. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I need to provide that. And they do it just before submission. But actually these are incredibly important parts to, to get through that review by the editor and have the editor move on to the next stage, which is a peer review. So again, I'd like to take a pause there and just see are there any questions about the editor's role? Uh, yes, Paul, we do have a question. Um, <laughs> what are Carger's views and guidelines on presenting individual demographics for smaller subject groups? For example, Anne is less than 40, uh, versus presenting a summary group demographic statistics in the manuscripts. Um, as summary stats occupy less real estate, uh, is this preferred over uh, for more transpa uh, transparency? Is this preferred over more transparency? I would. So. Okay, so yeah. So can you. Did you get the other one? What are Carver's views and guidelines on presenting individual demographics for smaller subject groups okay. um, versus presenting summary group demogra demographic statistics in the manuscript? Mm -hmm. Summary stats occupy yeah. less real estate. Um, yeah. Is this preferred? Uh, yeah, I, I, I see where it's coming. Um, so, Simply Carter doesn't have a view on that. It would come down to the editor themselves and the subject area and the type and the type of report. So obviously, if you're submitting a case series, you would be expected to have a lot of individual data. If you're submitting data on a large clinical trial, of course, you'll be working with summaries. Otherwise, you'd have the 200, 300 page clinical trial report. So the, it really depends on the editor the field and the type of paper that's being submitted. Great. And obviously have a look at, if you're looking at a particular journal, look at what the journals published in the past and how they prefer it. Great, thank you. Next question, uh, what's the impact of authors, institutions 
on the decision? Do editors check author databases usually? It, again, it would vary from editor to editor and field to field. It's very much, I, I, I couldn't say that a publisher would, but a publisher has no impact at all, basically. With an editor, an editor may or may not check to see whether that person, that person or that institution is published in that area or has a reputation in that area. Uh, I don't know how many editors do it. I know peer reviewers quite often do it. Um, if they are told who the authors are, with obviously with a double, with a single, so with a double blind, then the peer reviewers won't know who the authors are. Uh, so I, I don't think from the from the interactions I've had with editors, I don't think it has nearly as much weight as people think it does. I think editors just really want to publish good science, in my experience, and the main thing they're looking at. Is, is this an interesting topic? If I put it in my journal, will it generate interest? Will it generate citations? Will I be, will it draw readers to my journal? And will, people, will the prestige of my journal be increased by the fact that it's published this paper? Great, thank you, Paul. No, that's, uh, that's, hold on, we have one more Yeah, one more time for one more from this section. Sure, yeah. Um, why are Carver's pharmacology page limits only four pages to publish without an APC? I think it's not possible to write a manuscript within four pages. Mm -hmm. That's probably page charges rather than an APC, I would I would guess. Um, so Yet yeah, some journals, um, in particular fields, do say, limit the number of free pages in a manuscript. Um, and I suspect with pharmacology, it may be above four pages that you actually pay per, um, per extra page, or it may also be possible. I've never managed this journal, so I don't know it very well. But, but it may also be possible that if you pay an article processing fee and make it free of charge, then page charges are dropped because um, we don't we don't charge um, uh, APCs and page charges. So that is it. It was not, it was fairly common practice, and in the, as we move to the era of open access, that's becoming less and less frequent. I think some journals still do this often the ones where there's a lot of data and a lot of data tables that could just go into the supplementary material and I'm honest, I'm honestly not sure if pharmacology is one of those but it clearly encourages the authors to be as brief as possible and move as much as possible to the supplementary material to, to avoid the extra page charges. Yep sounds good thank you for that. And that really does vary by discipline. I mean, for example, with human um, developmental psychiatry, you have, immediate, you have papers of 15, 20 pages coming in. And then with others, we have disciplines where it's three, four pages. So often this is very subject area specific and also the editor deciding how, what size papers they want in the journal. They also have input, of course. Okay, so let's assume then the editorial office is satisfied. There's no sign of plagiarism. It's within the scope of the journal. It goes to the editor who likes the paper, feels it could have potential scientific impact. Then they will pass it over to the peer reviewers. Now, if we look at the different peer review types. We have single blind, where the reviewer knows who the authors are, but the author does not know who the reviewers are. We have double blind, where neither the reviewer and the authors know who each other are. Triple blind, which is quite rare, but even the editor is blind to who the reviewer and the authors are, and completely open, where the reviewer and the authors know each other's identities, and there are different types of open peer review, such as collaborative, where they can even discuss together rather than 
exchange comments. There's, there's more of a chat functionality actually on the paper. So different publishers use different types of review and different journals within the publishers themselves use different types of review. Uh, very often a, a particular area of science takes one of these models up a lot quicker than the other areas and is the norm for that particular field. So a lot of um, grant funded research in cellular biology, for example, tend to have more open peer review and that's which isn't necessarily true for some of the other fields, particularly the Carga publishes in. There are pros and cons to all of these types of peer review, and you just need to be aware about what you would like. Do you, do you feel happy sharing your identity with the reviewers, and do you feel happy knowing who they are, uh, or would you prefer that that was just kept anonymous? This is really something that the author has to decide when they submit and choose the journal. So with the peer reviewers, I've broken down what they're looking for by manuscript section of a original research paper. So introduction, methods, results, and discussion. So when a peer reviewer looks at the, this, at the introduction, sorry, the two main questions they're asking is, okay, is this, is there a problem statement? And is this problem statement either vague? Has it already been answered? Or is it frankly just a bit boring? And the other thing they're looking for with the introduction is have you reviewed the literature sufficiently? The introduction builds a case towards this problem statement or hypothesis at the end of the introduction. Have you built that case well? Or are there any, is there critical information or critical studies that are missing? So that foundation isn't there, which weakens the problem statement or hypothesis or the rationale for your study. So if the peer reviewer goes to the introduction section, that's what they're looking for. In the methods section, and this is where a lot of um, peer reviewer comments come, one of the biggest things we see, the study design won't answer the problem statement. So the authors have presented a clear problem they're trying to solve, but designed a study that will not provide an answer to it. Or that the methods are not well described, which limit the reproducibility of the study. And then maybe using a methodology or a technology that is outdated. And we may have incomplete data, for example, a small or biased sample or small control group or poor control group or the statistical power has not been correctly calculated. And this, again, the statistical analysis, either inappropriate or incomplete tools chosen. So really what they're asking when they look at the method section is, okay, well, authors, you've given me, told me what you're trying to do, and now you've told me how you're going to do it. Will that work? If we do it the way you said, will we get the results? that allow us to make a valid judgment on your hypothesis. So in the results section, things like inconsistent or inaccurate data reported or insufficient data being presented for the, to answer the, the problem statement or the reason for the study or problems with the tables and figures. And often you, you see this when one author takes responsibility for the results, one takes responsibility for the introduction, and another one takes responsibility for the methods. You can see the disjoint sometimes between these sections. And last but not least, when the peer reviewer goes to the discussion, uh, the key criticism that is often presented is that the conclusions in the discussion are just too ambitious and they're overstretching what the data actually indicate. And the discussion is also the author's chance to say how their work should fit into the literature. Uh, but to do that, you have to say what the state of the literature actually is. And if that's incomplete or inaccurate, then again, the peer reviewers will pick up on this. And at all points, introduction, methods, discussion, uh, unclear language or unclear structure. Uh, if peer reviewers, find it difficult to get through the paper. I mean, it, it's unpaid, generally peer reviewers are unpaid. 
the average length of a peer review is about five hours. So if a peer review gets an hour in and they're really struggling through the language, then it, they can either push for another four hours or just recommend to reject. So the languages written, the structure are really about making it as easy as possible for a peer reviewer to say yes or recommend accept. Because the peer reviewer doesn't make the final decision on your paper, that's the editor. What the peer reviewer does is recommend to the editor. Now there's four different types of recommendations a peer reviewer can give. They can recommend outright rejection. And normally this is where you have a, an interesting study question. The whole study just didn't need to be performed. There was no need to know the results. Or the methodology is so poor that the data being produced are worthless, that we can't interpret or use these data in future studies. So the peer reviewer here is saying, this study, I believe, has no can add no value to the literature if we publish it. The other, this, the next decision is a major revision. So this is where normally it's things around the results. So the study is sound, but it just needs some real work to extract the data. And you would assume with a major revision, uh, there may be, need to be additional tests, maybe need to be additional analyses, and you're looking at days to maybe even weeks of work to get the paper back to the stage where it can be resubmitted. Minor revision is much more to do with things like references, language problems, maybe some odd structural things, and perhaps a day, maybe two days to, to fix the problems there. And last but not least, that it doesn't happen very often, is a recommend accept on the first go with no changes. So that is very, very rare to see a peer review do, do that. Normally there are some recommendations, but it does happen. So before we go into handling the need for a revision, let's uh, revisit the questions here. Are there any questions about anything I've said so far? Uh, and the question is, how, how, how do you respond to reviewers who keep adding new issues after each response? Sometimes up to three by some reviewers. And uh, this questioner says, this is very frustrating, especially when the editor ends up rejecting the paper, even before giving you more time to respond to all these new issues that have been brought up. Good question. It, it's incredibly frustrating. Um, and I. I wish I had a better answer. It's really down to the editor of the journal to handle this. The editor um, has the final say. The editor should review the peer reviewer comments before they go out. And also, if they're completely new issues, should um, prevent this happening. Uh, I, I've also been on the end of this myself, so I, I, I know how frustrating it is, and I do really sympathize with anyone whenever it happens. Um, it it's rare. The most uh, the the editors that I know are normally very good at stopping this um, before it goes through so many rounds of revision. But it does happen, and unfortunately, it is incredibly frustrating when it does. And you just have to assume your manuscript has been improved by these comments and take it on to the next journal. And then, yep, okay. Uh, just another question about the peer review section before moving on. Uh, how much time does a reviewer get to review a paper by a journal? Does that depend on the editor and the journal, or what? what um, just to give us a sense of the time frame. It, it very much depends on the editor and the journal. Um, I would say the standard would be between anywhere and two to four weeks. Um, two to four. Yeah, I would say about two to four weeks. Um, uh, a very high impact, high turnover journal can normally get reviewers to respond quite quickly. Um, but it, I, I would say, yeah, about two, two to four weeks. Often reviewers um, want to do it and then say, look, I'm overcommitted at the moment, or I have holidays coming up, and they um, ask for an extension. So that can, that can often happen. But 
most I think most biomedical journals really want to get peer review done within one to one to two months. Okay. So normally that, that means a deadline of about two of about two to four weeks for the initial um, review. Uh, to accept a review, so after the initial invitation goes out, normally um, uh, invitation, then a reminder every couple of days for maybe two or three reminders. But again, it, it depends very, very much on the journal, the editor, and also very often the field. Um, we have a close-knit field. It can be a lot easier to find reviewers than a very vast field with experts scattered all around. Yeah. Okay, I just want to be, um, I'm conscious of the time, um, so I, I want, we have about 10 minutes left, but I want to make sure you're able to get through all of the sections. Um, so there are other questions that are coming through and that's great and we really appreciate all of these questions and we the ones that we unfortunately just because of time uh paul is unable to answer we will get back to you please um you know if you haven't already um, provide us with your email address and we're delighted to get back to you with answers to all of your questions especially the ones that we're unable to answer because of time today absolutely and so there's, there's not so much more to go through it um we've before we do, uh, apologies to everybody for the interruption. Um, my router stopped working, so I'm glad to be back now. And so I just want to talk about handling the need for revision, and it goes into one of the questions that came up. And it can be it can be frustrating, uh, but it is very rare for a paper to be accepted without revision. So you should expect one to three rounds of revision. Uh, again, try to be happy that it wasn't rejected and it is common for reviewers to leave a lot of comments that is that happens don't be upset by that i mean do try and think of it as somebody's just done an awful lot of unpaid work for you to improve your paper so try to approach it as much as possible with a sense of gratitude and sometimes the comments can be quite harsh uh, again i've been on the receiving end and very often you have to have to i often think that you know sometimes reviewers are communicating in a second language and it can sound a lot harsher than perhaps it would do if talking to another person from you know the a similar location to you and so when you respond to reviewers uh, be polite even if you think the point is unfair uh, i mean i've had i think about 50 percent of papers i've submitted and if you're pubmedding me, it was when I was a medical writer, so my name is not on them. Um, just the company I worked for us and the acknowledgements. But I would say that about 50% of the papers I submitted, at least one peer reviewer said I needed to have my English checked by a native speaker. So be polite, even if you think the comment is not fair. Uh, respond to each point that the reviewer raises. Um, some publishers use online markup tools. Some request uh, track changes in a Word document. And it's really okay to disagree with a reviewer, but as long as it's very respectful and wherever possible, try to provide evidence for your viewpoint. So the reviewer disagrees with you and gets, um, or is, is not as clear, then it gives you a bit more leeway with the editor to make your case and say, you know, I've provided evidence and I've provided rationale. And last but not least, stick to any deadlines from the journal to submit your revision that's uh, really important and um, journals have wildly different deadlines on how quickly you need to submit peer review revisions so do check so at this stage you pass through the editorial office the editor thinks your papers in scope and of impact it goes to the peer reviewers and they have now made a recommendation to the editor why would the editor reject you at this stage well the first thing could be that all the peer reviewers have said to, to reject the paper of course the second thing could be he feels he or she feels that the peer review comments have not been adequately addressed and that the peer reviewers have found some flaws with the paper but apart from that there's really very few reasons why an editor at that point would say no and all being well your paper will simply go on to be accepted now, 
I just have about two slides left and I'd like to come back to the questions. But just to say that the, re the reasons for rejection are thing where you really, it, it kills the paper dead. It seems like ignoring research ethics, um, a boring or an answer or already answered problem statement and a poor study design. It's things that make the data either unethical or uninteresting. That can kill a paper and make it very hard to get published anywhere. Um, things like a large fix, this is much more around the results section where um, maybe some more tests could help a different presentation of data. And there are of course like minor fixes, but this includes even getting rejected from a journal. If you get rejected very quickly, it can actually be really good news because they haven't found any serious scientific flaws. They haven't looked for them by them. It just means you're ju hopefully that the journal was just out of scope or too high impact and you just need to find a new journal to submit to. So if you take away one thing from this webinar, this is the last slide, it's that anything that kills a study completely and makes it impossible to get published, these are things like ethics, plagiarism, study design that should have been handled before the study was even performed. So anything are, Anything after that is almost too late. Some people think that the reason they don't get published is to do with the writing part, but actually it's generally always way, the reasons you trace back way, way, way before the study was performed. So if you only take away that from this webinar, it's certainly been worth it. So that was my last slide, and I'd really love to take any questions that anyone has. Yes, thank Paul. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, we have a few more questions um, that we think we can get in before the top of the hour. Uh, here's one. Um, is it appropriate to write to journals if there is no response after several weeks of peer review? Yes, that, that's fine. Um, some journals have um, systems where they can show you what stage the paper's at. Um, it can often take a while to find peer reviewers, but it, it's always fine to email the editorial office and ask for an update of your paper. Um, a lot of manuscript submission systems now, you can log in and, and see the status of where it is. Okay, uh, next. Sometimes articles are rejected and without showing any reason at all, and what should we do about that? You would probably assume that the impact if it was a high impact factor journal and it's rejected with no reason, you can probably assume that the somebody in the journal felt that the impact of the article was too low for that journal. But there's no, no reason whatsoever. Um, you could also assume if it's an extremely quick rejection um, that maybe the language may need looking at. If it's an editorial office rejection, the editorial office manager, remember they're looking at language plagiarism and things like that. So if it's extremely quick, it's probably not the probably not the scientific quality. Nobody would have looked in there and there's no reasons. Um, it would probably be that the wrong journal was chosen. Okay. Um, and that, that does happen and it's also happened happened to me. It can just be that the journal has too many papers and perceived impact just simply wasn't enough. But it is frustrating not to have any comments. Yeah. Yeah. Oh absolutely. Um, another good question. What, what do you what do you do as a native speaker if you're asked to revise um, your own language? Uh, who who do you turn to? <laughs> yeah. Um, so in, in my case, I was kind of lucky because I worked for a medical writing company and we had professional copy editors as well. Um, so I was always able to say this has been revised by a professional copy editor, and. However, we're happy to correct any mistakes if you find them. And that was normally sufficient to get it through. If you, if that's not sufficient, um, you may have to pay for a language editing service and show them the certificate if they won't accept that. It, de it depends on the journal, it depends on the reviewers. Uh, but like, the reason I mentioned that it's happened to me was to show that it's not uncommon that that happens. Uh, don't be offended by it. And I would say, yeah, if you can afford it, then to use a language editing service, 
if you can't then just say we've had this checked by a native speaker and obviously have it checked again by a native speaker, another one, and just put that into the, into the response for peer reviewers. Great. And we have, I think we have time for one more question. Um, do authors- I, 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 I have time. So it's, it's not, we don't have to finish exactly on the hour. If it runs over a few minutes, that's fine. I'm happy to take questions. Okay, good. Uh, pl plagiarism seems to be a, a popular topic um from your presentation um do authors get informed about plagiarism uh, if that's the case it would be i believe so again these processes that you've been shown can be tweaked by publishers um there this is the standard average workflow at the moment um, but each publisher and each journal will have its own particular taken its own particular quirks. I would say I, I'm, there's no good reason not to inform the authors, and I'm sure most, edit, most editorial offices would inform the authors and say, yes, this is the reason we're rejecting the paper. Okay, again, and again, sticking with the plagiarism theme, um, do you have a, a real, a good concise definition of plagiarism? Um, how, how do you define it? And um, I, I know we've talked about what, you've talked about what percentage, um, but but how would you define plagiarism uh, for the audience? There, there is not, to the best of my knowledge, a pre actual precise definition. Um, we we have these questions, of course, a lot in, internally, and to the best of my knowledge, there is no precise, agreed upon, universal definition of what exactly is plagiarism in this context. Uh, I would say if you are copying and pasting two or three long sentences word for word, you're starting to enter a, a gray area where you're not using quotations and so publishers often have to decide subjectively, do we view this as plagiarism or not? This will get less of a problem as science moves more towards open access and people have permission to copy and reuse each other's work. But at the moment, it's still up to publishers to make a subjective definition of whether they consider that plagiar um, copying and pasting plagiarism. I can say publishers are a lot more reluctant or less likely to view something as plagiarism if there's quotation marks and a reference to the source. So I can't just say three or four sentences of 180 characters. Uh, that definition doesn't exist. But we, uh, we can say three or more sentences of 180 characters will be less of a problem if there's quotation marks in the reference than if there's not quotation marks in the reference. Okay, um, and here's a good follow-up question. So as you suggested, not every similarity in writing and words is counted as plagiarism, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Similarity is not counted as plagiarism. Okay. It, All right. As, okay. it often gets a little bit tricky, like for example, with data, you can't, in theory, uh, they, you can always reuse data that's been published. But if you copy and paste the table, the format of it, the format of it is subject to copyright. But if you use the data in the table and make a figure, then that's different. So there's lots, lots of gray areas. So the key, the key thing is just don't, don't risk it. Don't go close to the gray areas. Paraphrase, don't copy and paste. Don't use screen grabs for figures. Um, just be safe and then it's not, it's not going to be a problem. And you can also, of course, also check the licenses of the sources that you're using. If somebody's used um, an open access license that it allows you to um, reuse the work, then again, this then that makes life a lot easier. And you, you, you can just normally attribute the source where it came from in your own work and say that it comes from there. Great. All right, well, I think we're a little bit over time, so um, I think we should probably wrap it up. Um, Paul, thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you. I want to thank everyone for attending.
today's uh, webinar. There are a few extra questions, which again, we, we are going to work on to get back to you some answers. We just didn't have the time to fit them in, but um, we will get back to you with, with answers to your questions, those that were unanswered. And um, I encourage everyone, if you enjoyed this uh, presentation and this webinar, please go to uh, the Carger website, www.carger.com, where you'll find campus courses, where you will find other courses just like this one, um, which are free uh, for you to look at uh, and to learn from. And we encourage you to visit, visit that and, and, uh, and help you in your, your careers. So thanks again to everyone for your attending attending today and um, wish you all uh, a very pleasant rest of your day. Thank you very much everybody. Thanks for your attention. Thanks all. Bye-bye.